reached the third panel that will focus on the challenge of mitigating and adapting to climate change. And we will uh, try to answer the question, how can innovation studies address the challenge of climate change? Uh, I'll just short introduce myself and then I will introduce the panelists and then we start with the first presentation. So my name is Anna Amenov and I come from the Ministry of Education and Research from the Division of Research Policy focusing on innovation and European research policy. I actually have a research background, but in the field of medical genetics. And with us today, we have four prominent professors. We have Frank Giels, that is a professor uh, at System Innovation and Sustainability from the University of Manchester. We have Lars Cohen, that is an associate professor and an expert in sustainability research here at Circle. And he also is a senior researcher at NIFU. Then we have Marianne Feldman. He, she is a Heinegger Distinguished Professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina. And last year she received the Global Award for Entrepreneurship Research. And we also have Cohen Franken, that is a professor in innovation studies at Utrecht University and a guest professor here at Circle. So let's start with the first presentation from Frank Eels. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm going to get started straight away. Uh, this talk is about social technical transitions and climate change. Um, and actually, I think innovation studies has things to offer, but there are also various challenges I think innovation studies has if it wants to address this topic. So that's what I want to focus on in the second half of this uh, talk. I mean, the climate change problem is, is getting worse uh, very rapidly. These are the rising emissions uh, worldwide. Uh, you can see very clearly the rise of China. Uh, you also see in the top right corner the little blip of the economic crisis. So a little blip there, but then afterwards emissions have been rising uh, faster than ever before. So despite climate change policy in the last 20 years, there's very little evidence of uh, much success. The IP and one reason is, of course, climate change is uh, not only... Is, is not a, well, it, is, it is a global problem, but you need to look at specific sectors. So this is just from the IPCC, you've got the electricity and heat sector, industry, agriculture and food, transport, buildings and other energy. And this already is, is one challenge for, for uh, innovation studies that I think we have many studies in the electricity domain and some in transport, which look at wind turbines and solar cells and battery electric vehicles, loads of them. We've got very little papers on food, food consumption, buildings, heat. These are really understudied topics. So e even in Germany, where they are doing the Energiewende, the energy transition, it's only about electricity. In all the other domains, there's very little evidence of any progress. So sometimes we are deluding ourselves if we, if we just look at the electricity sector, which is the only one where, where there is some progress. In, in almost all the other sectors, there's very little evidence of, of progress. So to address climate change, that means we need shifts to new kind of systems in those various sectors that I just mentioned. And the idea is that we can still do quite a lot with incremental change by making the internal combustion engine more efficient, maybe even a factor two, so 50% improvement over 20 years. But that's not enough. If we really want to address climate change, we know we need 80% reduction in the big, in the, uh, worldwide, which we can only achieve by shifting to new kinds of energy systems, new kinds of food systems, new kinds of buildings, new kinds of transport systems. So that, that's, the, that's the rationale behind the new discourse on system transitions, which also takes, which just like innovation systems, takes a system perspective, but actually it, it, it asks a much more dynamic question, how can we change entire systems? So it does change the unit of analysis from innovation systems to uh, socio-technical systems. I do think there are indications that this debate on social technical transitions is one of the really big ones, actually, in innovation studies. Uh, at least if you look at the most cited papers in these three innovation journals, they appear in really in the top uh, ones in the last five years that people really think this, these are worth citing. So research policy, seven out of 25 most cited papers are about sustainability transitions. 
in technology analysis and strategic management, six out of ten of the most cited papers. And technological forecasting and social change, five out of 25 of the most cited papers are about social technical transitions. So I, I think this, this is really a big debate which is playing out in the mainstream journals. And, and this graph is just it's until 2010. I took it from Jochen Markert. It's showing the rise of publications and number of citations in the mainstream innovation journals. So I, so I was pleased to see that Circle is latching on to this uh, big debate, which, which is uh, currently unfolding in the literature. I think this new debate about social technical transitions invites some new creative thinking. This, this is what I've heard from other people who, who have been reading this literature. They say, well, what I really like about this literature is not that it's got all the answers, but it, at least it asks interesting new kinds of questions. Because the innovation systems literature has been funded in the 80s and 90s and has been codified. And so, yeah, that's all, that's, that's all working very well, but we sort of know what to do in order to do innovation systems well. So, what some people like about the, these big questions around social technical transitions is it, it asks new kind of questions and it tries to be explicitly interdisciplinary. So, in terms of the uh, innovation typology from Freeman and Perez, who themselves, of course, looked at the uh, techno economic paradigms and long waves. It actually asked this question at the third level of their typology, which because they had incremental change, radical innovation, technology systems, and then techno-economic paradigms. Very few people since their typology have looked at the technology system level. So I, I think that's maybe one novelty of this debate about transitions. Uh, as I said in my introduction, it, it, it introduces a new unit of analysis, which is, this is just an example of the socio-technical transition for transport which includes innovation systems, but is broader. It also looks at infrastructure and fuel and consumer practices uh, and garage and, and, and uh, repair, cultural meanings associated to cars. Because if you want to change the transport system, it's not enough to just change the cars and, and shift to hybrids. Uh, that, that, also, that, that You need to shift in those cars, but it also brings in fuel, uh, maintenance red networks, uh, charging infrastructure and all that. And, and maybe even we need to shift from cars to intermodal transport or other types of, of mobility. Secondly, I think um, innovation is crucial in this whole literature. So it, it really comes from innovation studies, but it, it, it pays a bit more emphasis, I think, to the social enactments of innovation. And explicitly, it also tries to combine the three sub-communities that, in my view, make up innovation studies, in which each have their own conferences, their own journals, their own professional societies. You've got evolutionary economics, economics of innovation with the Schumpeter Society, but you also have STS, or Sociology of Science and Technology, which has got its own uh, organizations and journals, and then you've got the innovation management. And my feeling is they don't talk very much uh, together. So that's, uh, I think, one aim to, to, to try to span those three communities. This new debate also sees technology as being played out in, in a wider economic, social and political context. So it tries also to make to something that Elisa in the previous presentation also mentioned. It tries to also make bridges to the wider social sciences, neo-institutional theory, political economy, the role of power, but also social movement theory, how are issues being mobilized, discourse theory and maybe even consumption studies. And, and, and one maybe provocative comment on the slides of circle with the link to the different disciplines. There was no direct link to the social sciences. Um, and fourthly, I think this, this new debate asks questions about directionality of innovation. So not just amount and output, so patents and all that and knowledge flows, which is the normal question, it's actually asked what is the direction of innovation? Can we steer it and maybe impact, which was also raised? So I think it therefore asks more questions about politics and cultural visions. Maybe, maybe looking more at the selection environment of innovation. So not just the knowledge side in evolutionary economics, but also the selection environment. Um, in this debate, in, the, in this literature, we've developed a, uh, a heuristic framework, a, a multi-level perspective. Uh, which looks at radical innovations emerging in niches, so there's a sort of evolutionary way of thinking, and they are then struggling against wider regimes, which are technological regimes, but are broader and socially embedded. So it is, it is about the big issue of stability and change. Radical change emerging in small niches, initially seen as weird and small, and done by often by outsiders, entrepreneurs, and then the issue of stability and lock-in and path dependence, and we, and we know all that there's all kind of all kind of mechanisms that create path in instability. So we are asking how do stability and change play out in the long term? 
And this is the picture if you take a more longer term perspective, 20, 30 years. Niches emerge, very small, lots of trial and error, entry and exit, unclear where to go, disagreement, uh, learning going on, and a, a fairly stable regime, which is technologically, but also infrastructure and, and politics and consumer practices. And the idea is that transitions only come about if three things happen at the same time. You need those niche innovations gaining internal momentum, which is through price performance improvements, increasing returns to adoption, big firms, powerful players throwing their weight behind them. But you, you usually also need some kind of external pressure, a shock, which then creates a wind, which opens up the regime and creates windows of opportunity for change. So I thought there was, there's lots of similarities with actually the first presentation we saw today about whether or not the crisis has led to a, uh, an opening up and a window of opportunity for broader change. So that's all I wanted to say about what we found. I would just like to end in the last three minutes um, with some challenges, what this means for innovation studies and where I think we need to maybe uh, do more or maybe ask different kind of questions. I think one is we need to better understand diffusion. So that's maybe what was behind my question about knowledge. Of course, we, of course, knowledge remains important and the emergence of innovation. But if we want to address the climate change problems, we need to understand diffusion much better. All the climate science says we need to start decreasing emissions in the West before 2020, if, if we're serious about the two degree target, which means we, we really need to upscale. Many of the innovations have been around for a long time, for 20, 30 years, the battery electric vehicles, solar cells, wind turbines, they all exist, but none of more than one or 2% market share. So the question is how can we upscale them very rapidly? And I think we need some breakthrough scaling up which requires stronger policies, maybe a sense of urgency, public support, but also market opportunities. So I think this is a challenge for diffusion theory. Which was, was this, this is diffusion that is not demanded by the market. So it's different from consumer electronics and cell phones, uh, and often is about new systems, whereas much of innovation theory is about very discrete products. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is also resistance to change. There are many big players out there who don't want to change, who have vested interests. And my, my impression, in, especially since the crisis, is that we've got an organized fight back from the big industries who are, of course, using the crisis to emphasize prices and costs and employment and all that. So, there, yes, we need a transition to low carbon, or, but, but many, many firms don't want it, of course. They've got lots to lose. Coal industry, gas industry, big food, and if you look at the political campaign donations, particularly in the US, they've been really increasing in the last five years because they are now playing the political game very actively. So we need to look a bit more at politics and, and the corporate political strategies, what firms do in order to keep things off the agenda or to water them down or to create loopholes. The third challenge is I think most innovation studies focuses a bit too much on the electricity and transport sector which together only account for 40% of emissions. So we need maybe to do more on food and buildings and heating. And innovation is crucial in all these sectors, but also the consumption side, of course. If you mean food, we, we know dairy and meat are the, are the two really big, the big ones. And well, how are we gonna change it? The, the transition's actually going in the wrong way with more people around the world eating more meat rather than less. The fourth point, I think uh, we have too high hopes. We focus too much still on the technology on eco-innovation, and we have too little understanding of demand. And this has been a recurring <laughs> problem, a phrase up by various people, uh, by, by, by Dozy, by Metcalf. By, uh, we, we innovation studies, even though evolutionary economics talks about variation and selection, we, we, don't look, we don't still look that much at the demand side. The fifth point is about speed, basically. And it, the idea, if we just hope that innovation will solve the problem, that is too naive. Because we know, I mean, I've done a lot of historical studies, they take 20, 30, 40 years. That's going too slow if we want to address the climate change problem. And in particular, I just want to highlight just in, in 30 seconds, the carbon budget problem, which is basically that the proven fossil fuel reserves, which you see here in those bars, coal, oil, and gas, we can, th these are the proven ones, so not the probable ones or the possible reserves, which are even bigger. This is just what we have already found. And what the climate science, you can just calculate if you want to stay under two degrees, how much can you burn? So what we can burn is one third of what we have found already. So the question is, we can, the question is how can we terminate perfectly viable industries such as coal and oil and 
what is the legitimacy to say you, have, you can no longer exist? How can we make sure this coal will never be burned? So the idea that we can solve climate change just by stimulating the green renewables is, 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 is naive because Australia, Canada, Russia, the United States, all the, the big countries with lots of fossil fuels will of course try to sell and burn this. So I have no answer to this, but this is a really going to be a really big struggle. How, it's not just about the green, it's also how do we get rid of the, the, the dirty fuel. And, and there is a lot of debate about, about this, how can we get rid of coal, the disinvestment movement, uh, people are withdrawing their money from this. So it's a big debate, I think, which will, which would require looking in much more to politics and vested interests. And, and what is, how can politicians t talk to industries and say, well, in five years time, you really need to stop. And then the last point, which is maybe also a bit of a reflection on the whole framing of this, of this conference, is we, we take a bit of a almost technocratic way of these are the problems, what are the solutions? And I, I think my plea would be, because we know very much about technology life cycles and industry life cycles, actually there's a literature which talks about issue life cycles. So social problems themselves also have a dynamic. Initially it's often the scientists or activists who say there's a problem, they're being ignored, it needs to spill over to public opinion, the politicians say we set up a committee, of course the industry says it doesn't exist. Lots of examples, obesity is, is, is going to be like this, smoking, uh, I think civil rights, the point that Elisa raised, but also climate change. So it's not just enough to look at the solutions, we also need to understand where does a sense of urgency come from, where does political will come from, where does... It was rising until the crisis, lots of public attention, there were almost movies every, uh, every day on the, on the television. It's, it's collapsed since then, the attention, the sense of urgency. So that, that's all I want, I mean, there's lots more to say about this, but we need to look at the co-evolution of problems and solutions. So not just the solutions, I guess this, this comes back to, we also need to understand the selection environment. If, how, how does that change? Under which circumstances? Can, it's no point saying politicians need to be heroic. They can only do it under certain circumstances when the public is concerned and when there are social movements uh, lobbying for, for something. So just to flag up some advertising of, of two papers that are now forthcoming in research policy, my own, I'm afraid. Um, they are about, uh, I've developed a dialectic issue life cycle model. So it follows issues over time and how industries uh, respond. So that's my plea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um now, thanks a lot, uh, Frank, for uh, an excellent sort of general introduction also to the uh, transition literature on which I'm going to happily piggyback. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of take the discussion in the area of um, innovation policy, low carbon innovation policy. I'm afraid I won't even also give any sort of solutions to uh, how innovation, innovation policy could uh, tackle climate change. I probably would be working in consulting if I had that answer. Uh, so I'm rather going to try to sort of discuss uh, how we perhaps can rethink uh, innovation policy if we take it into the uh, low carbon uh, domain. And um, sort of these reflections are, are very much based on sort of the research that we're doing at Circle on innovation, innovation systems in relation to renewable energy and re in relation to sort of low carbon solutions in the field of, for example, also transport. But sort of to first go to sort of the policy field that is directly con concerned with, with climate change, climate policy, uh, there are some sort of particularities um, about this policy that I would like to sort of raise and also to relate it to, to, to innovation. So the sort of the typical way how climate policy is, 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 is working is that the objective is basically to sort of uh, meet long-term reduction targets in carbon emissions. This is, to, to sort of agree with Frank, already a very much a political game, and, and there's a lot of sort of global geopolitics uh, going on in, in, in that line. Um, and the basic idea is to meet those uh, reduction targets. We need to sort of make that transition from fossil fuels to, to renewables. And this is sort of implied by the figure on, on, on the right, uh, even though it's very unclear uh, what will be sort of the dominant uh, technologies or renewable energy sources that are going to substitute uh, the fossils which are supposed to be faded out. 
Um, but when it comes to sort of the instruments uh, in climate policy, there is a sort of a very strong belief, uh, a mantra in a sense, uh, to sort of let the market solve it. But we need to create a market um, for carbon. So there is a lot of sort of belief in the, in the, in the instrument of carbon pricing. Uh, sort of following sort of classical economic logic that we need to correct for the market failure, uh, the externalities of, uh, of climate change. And there again, sort of a, a, an econ economic mantra comes in that this needs to be done very cost efficiency, and that's why we need to have one target and one measure, and the measure being carbon pricing. And additionally to that, sort of the plea for carbon pricing is that it's, car it's technology neutral. And there it becomes interesting for innovation scholars, I think, because that makes the connection. Um, but at the same time, technology neutrality is a pretty sort of um, neoliberal uh, idea. Um, to quote uh, George Bush, um, emission reduction incentives should be technology neutral because the government should not be picking winners and losers in these emerging markets. But as Frank was also pointed out, uh, climate policy is not really delivering um, as it should. Um, and there are already a lot of sort of good uh, explanations not coming from economics for that. That, for example, technology neutral carbon pricing primarily sort of uh, creates incentives for low-hanging fruit innovations. So it does create sort of demand and a market for low-carbon innovation, but particular types of innovations, quite incremental in a sense. And a lot of ana analysis and scholars have argued that they do not provide the incentive structure for the advanced technologies that are needed in the long term 2030, 2050. In addition to that, um, technology neutrality sort of uh, disregards other externalities that, that can occur when you start sort of really selecting uh, those, uh, th those technologies, those innovations. And I think this is well illustrated with the example of, uh, of biofuels and how that led to a, a, a discussion about uh, fuel for food, uh, food for fuel. So in that sense, sort of the, 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 the policy apparatus for, for, for climate change uh, within climate policy is pretty narrow. And in that sense, we can sort of think what can, and also it sort of the black boxes um, the notion of, of innovation, right? It's sort of supposed to just happen because there will be a market for low carbon innovations. So in that sense, I think this sort of reminds a little bit about the sort of discussions we had at the start of sort of innovation systems, innovation studies, where the economist sort of black boxed innovation and technology, but when it came to growth challenges. And in that sense, sort of there is still a challenge that a lot of innovation policy as usual is primarily uh, sort of targeting economic growth and competitiveness. And there, obviously, you can, can make a distinction between more or less fair uh, innovation policy and the systemic innovation policy, where here at, at Circle and, and in the Nordic countries, there is a strong emphasis on the more sort of systemic innovation policy. And I think it has some sort of um, some, some merits also to trying to understand low carbon innovation because systemic innovation policy is very sensitive to the particular context dependent innovation constraints or the sector specific innovation constraints, pointing to quality and quantities of particular innovation capabilities, uh, how there can be sort of constraints in institutions or a lack of enabling institutions, um, how there can be sort of fragmented networks or sort of myopic networks. And these could be all sort of rationales for sort of also policy to, 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 to stimulate low carbon um, innovation, but um, they are not sort of really targeting the specific constraints that, that we know of uh, with regard to eco uh, to low carbon innovation f coming from the field of uh, sustainability transitions. And some of these insights, and some have already been mentioned by Frank, is that there are additional sort of system failures when we're thinking about low carbon innovation. Uh, of course, the issue of demand and market creation for these kinds of innovations, but also issues like public legitimacy for emergent technologies. Uh, carbon storage and, and capture is, is a good example where this legitimacy issue is, is, is very um, uh, prominent. Um, how to stimulate entrepreneurial experimentation, where the emphasis is really on, on the sort of experimentation uh, aspect. What do we actually mean also by experimentation? And how could policy uh, support that? Uh, the issue of directionality and, and what sort of direction uh, is policy sort of trying to push uh, innovation? 
and can policy, should policy, uh, also address this, this, this barrier of resistance to, uh, to change? Now, um, perhaps then the field of transition uh, studies or ha has, has some, some sort of policy uh, um, implications. This to me is a bit of a conundrum because even though there's, I think, a very sophisticated theory around sort of low carbon innovation, sustainability transitions, if you really see, look at the sort of the policy impacts coming from this field, it's quite weak. I've, I've been working with it myself in, in the Netherlands where there was sort of a formal uh, transition policy and sort of in retrospect, this policy has not really um, made any muscles. It has not really created a lot of impact. Um, there are now some sort of uh, explanations or suggestions for why transition policy has not really made that impact. Uh, I should perhaps mention that what transition policy or management would really sort of prescribe is that you need to do a lot of experiments with very different stakeholders, uh, going sort of beyond sort of triple helix, but also really inv involving users, invo involving NGOs, uh, aligning then expectations around sort of new technologies, new innovations, and in that sense sort of building a consensus about how uh, a transition should look like. And, well, in a sense, it's a typical that this sort of model then comes from, from the Netherlands, because it's very much based sort of on a consensus-based model of, uh, of coordination. Uh, but it has also been sort of criticized for taking a very managerial, technocratic perspective on policy and governance, sort of policy having sort of the tools to just sort of put on uh, the market creation function in, in an innovation system. And in that sense, sort of, I think that a lot of the policy uh, discussions around transitions, transition management, remain to be sort of stuck in, in their niches. So to wrap up a bit, um, I think the lessons that we learn from uh, looking at low-carbon uh, innovation is that sort of innovation policy, uh, the way we sort of you know it, tends to overemphasize supply side, and this is a, a real problem uh, for low-carbon innovation. And it requires really a policy mix. If you see at all the sort of system failures that can be related to low carbon innovation, um, we need to really instruments that cut across sort of the supply and demand side and also pay attention to intermediation. The problem is, I think, that a lot of these sort of policy instruments are distributed across different policy domains. So we see that sort of, for example, market creation falls within the domain of, of climate policy. While if you look at sort of where, where this policy supports the production of new knowledge, technologies, this is typically perhaps in the field of, of science, technology, innovation policy. So there is apparent need for policy coordination, and this is nothing new. This is something that we've also been hearing a lot about in the literature, but I think the question is really how to do that. And here I would like to sort of also conclude with a more geographical perspective. Um, in a sense, sort of pointing to uh, some observations made now that um, this sort of question of policy coordination for low carbon uh, innovation uh, is obviously also conditioned by, by sort of institutional arrangement, institutional context. And there is some sort of preliminary uh, um, observations that more state centric uh, institutional uh, configurations seem to be front running. Uh, in that respect, and that sort of points in direction to the performance of Germany, Denmark, but also uh, some Asian countries when it comes to, to grain growth. But it also sort of opened up the discussion for sort of what people would call policy or governance experimentation, really sort of trying to come up with, up with new instruments for, for, for innovation policy and sort of new ways of, of engaging with, with stakeholders. And there is an interesting sort of discussion or uh, research also going on on the role of cities and regions as sort of these policy experimentation places to come up with, uh, with new solutions and new policies for uh, low carbon uh, innovation. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. So... Okay, wonderful. So it's nice um, to be here today, and I may need some help with this because I'm a Mac person, and, I, oh, yeah. Okay, is there a way to do presenter view? Yeah. Okay, great.
great. So really, I, this is not an area in which I do research, and I realized um, that this was sort of a challenge. And so, well, you know, let me sort of try to understand why I haven't thought this was a very interesting area to research. No offense, guys. But, um, you know, I'm taking a, in, like a geographic bent to this, and I want to ask a provocative question that I think we should ask, and that is simply, are cities good for the environment? Are we headed in a sustainable direction? And so really, this is a sort of um, her heretical for me because I really do believe in cities. I believe in cities as the locus of innovative activity. And what we notice is that just recently we've reached a tipping point where more than half of the world's population now lives in cities and urban areas. And this is increasing exponentially. By, seven, by 2050, 70% 70 of the world's population will live in cities. And so at first blush, that might be good news, and I really do think following, this is a quote from Jane Jacobs, The Life and Death of American Cities. But, you know, dense cities are natural generators of diversity. They're prolific incubators of new enterprises and ideas. And so, you know, I've sort of believed this my whole career. Um, we also see that, well, there's lots of studies that say density lowers per capita energy use. These studies are a little bit unsatisfying because they're typically just looking at fuel consumption, um, direct energy costs, and they're not looking systemically, as Frank suggests we might. At the same time that Jane Jacobs was writing her book, there was a woman named Rachel Carsons who wrote Silent Spring. And the premise there was that we, had, we were degrading the environment with our technology and that this was no longer sustainable. And so really that kind of predates. Jacobs was not thinking about the adverse environmental impacts of cities. And so, you know, just because I don't know much about this, I turned to my bookshelf and saw three books that are very recent that all um, have titles that are really not like academic titles. They're almost like bumper stickers, and they, you know, sort of tell you everything about them in their title. So David Owen is an editor at The New Yorker, and he writes about New York City, Green Metropolis, um, why living smaller, living closer and driving less are the keys to sustainability. And he argues that it's a good thing that we'll all be living in cities because density really decreases our use of um, automobiles, we have smaller houses, we spend less on heating, okay, we spend more on air conditioning, but, you know, really it's just better that we would be in cities. Ed Glazer, Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier, and Happier. Um, and so, um, I, I'll just leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Vishan um, Chakabarti, who is a city planner, um, and he writes about a country of cities, a manifesto of urban America. And he claims, if you like nature, live in a city. And he also has another great um, phrase. He says, the greenest thing is blacktop. Okay. And so, you know, I just like to be a contrarian. And so I really wonder, are these things true? And so um, there is another recent book by Ted Steinberg, who is at Case Western Reserve. And it is a nice history of um, the ecology of New York City, Gotham Unbound. And really, he says, wait a minute, once you start to look at the local environmental impacts, really the city has not been so good um, you know, for its local um, area. It looks at the decline of marshlands and other habitats, the loss of different species of birds and fish, um, the water, water quality is just a perennial problem. Um, and he also then factors in sort of agricultural transport. And really, with the systemic view, what we see is, well, if you have everybody living in a city, this is why you need agribusiness. This is why we need mass production of agriculture, because it's the only way we can feed concentrated populations.
And it seems to me that sustainable cities require radical innovation and really new models of development. In the US, we do have cities that are experimenting, and so Portland is a very, very green area. Um, and though people say about Portland, it's where 20-year-olds go to retire. And so there is a sort of a different model if you want to be green. I'm, I'm having fun, so please. And it seems to me, when I look at those four books that were on my bookshelf, that they were really all talking about New York City and really saying that, well, American cities are much greener when we compare them to American suburbs. But American suburbs, I think, are nothing that anybody would want to emulate. And they are really built around a car culture. And um, I feel that there is, in the literature, this automatic reflux to endorse growth, 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 and more growth. And really growth, perhaps, at the expense of economic development. And then, as Lars has pointed out, the problem with this is that this entire system that we're dealing with is all driven by market-based choices. And when we think about this spatial configuration of cities, this is not driven by planners. I wish it were, but it's driven by powerful developers. And these developers use, really, they view land solely as a tool for capital accumulation. And what we see is that in cities, we have higher costs of living, and we have less individual asset accumulation. So we're taking assets from individuals and putting it into developers. And when we think about Hernando de Soto, when we don't have asset ownership, we can't become entrepreneurial. We can't start businesses. We can't take risks. And I think that this is something we need to think about. So New York is a great place, but what about the rest of America? And a wonderful documentary called Detropia, which is the sort of just a position of Detroit and dystopia. And so Detroit is sort of now kind of a national joke. It's lost population. But when you go back to the turn of the century, there are two poignant periods in American history when Detroit was very successful. So in 1920, there were more millionaires in Detroit than anywhere else in the United States. And in 1960, per capita manufacturing wages were higher than anywhere else in the country. So Detroit was really the Silicon Valley of its time. It was a very successful industrial agglomeration that fell on hard times. And now, a lot of areas are um, really fallen into disuse. There are just tremendous problems with crime and environmental degradation. And it remains to be seen whether the city can remake itself. And it's trying to do this, trying to do this in a process. But um, it's a cautionary tale, I think. So I also want to think about, well, that's America, but what about the rest of the world? And so this is from um, the Department of Geography at the University of Cologne, and this is a project that looks at mega cities. And what we see is, well, New York by itself, and even the American experience, is really not representative of a mega city that we have more in South America. And then look at this through Asia. And so this, these mega cities are very, very different from New York. And also, they are in low-lying areas where sustainability is potentially um, a tremendous problem with global warming. And so, again, I believe in innovation. I think innovation gets us out of a lot of hot water and tight fixes. Yet, we have a lot of innovation in this technology space, but it's not being commercialized. Frank, you thought it was due to diffusion, and I think it's even more problematic than that. 
This is another New Yorker cartoon, and here we have evolution, right? We have a fish climbing out of the water onto land. Really, this is a radical breakthrough. This is something so fundamental. What does the fish say? Wonder if I can monetize this. Right? How am I going to make money? And if the fish couldn't monetize it, well, then we really would have environmental sustainability because none of us would be here. And so I think this larger issue of the system of innovation that we've set up does not favor these sort of radical innovations. It does not favor solutions to global challenges. So what we're getting is kind of a gadget economy where my cell phone can do everything, right? But I worry about a lot of other things. I think the question that we need to ask, and I think Circle, because of the talent here, is in a unique position to address these questions of what kind of world do we want anyway. We know we need radical, revolutionary, systemic change. And I think we need new models. And I think it's new business models. I think there's a lot of exciting work now that revolves around social entrepreneurship, um, venture philanthropy, and sort of thinking of new ways of getting innovations to market. But we also need better policy models. And um, I think that we have a need for research to better direct policy initiatives. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um. Well, my talk is going to echo uh, a number of uh, issues of the previous speakers, but I will uh, start from a slightly different uh, angle, that of evolutionary economics, uh, as well as evolutionary economic geography. And I'm also going uh, into a specific development uh, claimed to be sustainable, that is the sharing economy. Uh, now. What I think, uh, if we th think about sustainability transitions, is uh, what Mar Marianne just said, is that we really need a fundamental new uh, framework to, to study this. And I very much welcome uh, the initiative of, of Lars and his colleagues to, to take this challenge up at Circle and to link uh, with other uh, institutions in Europe and elsewhere. And if you look from evolutionary economics point of view, I think we move, have to move from an evolutionary to a co-evolutionary framework. Um, and actually, uh, some work has been done on this, and not uh, uh, by someone uh, unknown, uh, and that's Richard Nelson. So Richard Nelson, partly uh, reacting to critiques of sociologists uh, in the 90s, started to, uh, to, to enlarge his framework of evolutionary economics, to include not only supply and demand, uh, but also institutions and the relationships between them. Now, if we talk about supply, we can talk about many things. Uh, the issue of knowledge and different knowledge bases and, and the importance to recombine knowledge from different uh, uh, domains. We can think of uh, the recent work at Circle about relatedness. Uh, so how do regions evolve from one industry into a related industry. We can think of global innovation networks and we can think of entrepreneurship. So clearly, uh, we have done the supply part, right? We know a lot and, 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 and of course it has to be improved, uh, but it's sure that, uh, that that's not the weak part. Then if we move to demand, uh, frankly, uh, not a lot has been uh, done. And why is demand so crucial? in innovation processes, because there is no demand out there for a new innovation. Demand needs to be articulated, especially by the users themselves. So the notion that still many economists adhere to, that it is the entrepreneurial discovery to, found out, to find out what people actually already want and providing them uh, with that uh, need uh, is, I think, fundamentally false. Uh, preferences are not out there, they are shaped, uh, they are changing as part of a social uh, process. And here I w uh, are there are some uh, examples, for example, by Franco Malerba, who I just saw coming in, 
who wanted to include uh, users in, uh, in his uh, innovation system framework. And there's also work by uh, Bernard Truffer uh, on how users and user collectives uh, articulate their demand and help uh, to bring about new uh, innovations. And then there's, of course, von Hippel's work on user innovation, which continues to inspire many uh, scholars um, uh, around the world. Now, and then I move to uh, institutions. And here, I do not mean only how institutions affect innovation, but much more how innovation prompts changes in institutions and prompts actors to challenge institutions. Uh, and, and here, we should not think of the government necessarily as the prime actor uh, in, uh, in, in, in doing the institutional change. Governments mostly react to other actors in society who uh, call for uh, institutional change. And then, not all institutions are formal anyway, and a lot of institutions are informal uh, and controlled by uh, citizens themselves. Now, if you put all this together, we have a co-evolutionary model where if you look at uh, new technologies, sustainable technologies or other technologies, there's a continuously interaction between supply conditions, technological opportunities, competing uh, business models, uh, prompting uh, changes in demand practices, uh, institutionalization of demand, uh, and then uh, also uh, new forms of regulation and, and, and social norms. And I think, and, I, and of course I'm also much to blame for looking at uh, too much at the supply side and seeing demand and institutions more as ex exogenously given, uh, I think another mistake that, uh, that many of us make is to associate always supply with firms, de demand with consumers, and institutions with government. Okay? In any kind of innovation process, in principle, any actor can take on any role. Okay? And, uh, and if you look more carefully into history, the, the very big transitions were not driven by firms, they were not driven by consumers, and they were not driven by governments, but they were driven by social movements. By social movements of citizens uh, that collectively uh, challenged institutions, started new consumption practices, and, 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 and called for new uh, innovations. So think of the, uh, the labor uh, movement, the women's movement, uh, civil rights movements. So I think fundamentally uh, change will have to come from, uh, from, from more from the bottom up than from uh, from firms uh, and, sit and consumers and uh, governments as such. Now, a very nice example uh, where you see all these dynamics uh, happening is uh, the sharing economy. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that really uh, uh, is very prominent now in, in, in Dutch newspapers and, and, and abroad as well, uh, because it has taken everyone by surprise. Yeah, and, uh, and there are different examples of uh, companies. So there is Uber. Uh, I just read they also started in, uh, in Stockholm and Gothenburg, who is providing a platform uh, for people not just um, to take a taxi, but also to drive around people to become a taxi driver yourself. Uh, then there's Airbnb, a platform aggregating all the demand and supply of, uh, of houses that you can rent uh, from one person to, to the other, so peer to peer. And then uh, a very different kind of platform in the Netherlands, uh, also now abroad, is Peerby. And that's a platform where you can simply borrow uh, from any other person in your neighborhood any kind of item, including clothing, drilling machines, uh, or what have you. And these things go very fast because they are platform-based and uh, the advantage of those platforms increase exponentially with the number of users, so you have these increasing returns kicking in. But why does this co-evolutionary framework work so well here? Well, it is very much driven by users and also driven by users changing social norms about consumption, about uh, ownership, uh, so think, for example, about car ownership. In many countries, it is no longer growing with uh, GDP, but there is a trend, uh, a change in the trend, uh, mainly driven by younger people uh, not necessarily owning a car, 
once they start uh, making money. So there are really fundamental user practices being challenged. Doesn't mean they will change throughout the society necessarily, but there are, are uh, new type of users uh, trying to organize their lives in a new way. And at the institutional side, we see that current institutions are challenged, not in the least because some of these platforms are basically facilitating illegal activity, right? So Uber uh, is facilitating people to drive around other people without a permit. And that's why most uh, cities uh, have banned Uber so far. But uh, what's U U what Uber is trying to do is to create a public discussion, hoping uh, cities will change their regulations. Now, this is just one example of a of an, uh, of an, if you like, social movement uh, that is uh, challenging existing institutions. And all kinds of questions uh, uh, pop up for, for research to, to, to look at. For example, how should we define the sharing economy? Uh, okay, so I can go on for this uh, for, for, for longer, but what is sharing is socially negotiated. It is controversial and it is used by companies in a strategic manner, uh, even though many of the practices uh, they, uh, they organize, in my view, are not part of the sharing economy. Second question, is it sustainable? So what does the environment gain from, from this? In many cases, it will only prompt more tourism, Airbnb, or it will prompt more car use, uh, Uber, etc. Um, and then thirdly, and more fundamentally, who owns those platforms, who owns the sharing economy. There are competing business models, uh, one that's uh, owned by firms like Uber, where Google invests in, but there are also platforms that are user-owned and user-run. And for government, it is very important to create uh, conditions that also these user-led initiatives uh, can take off uh, because uh, of the, let's say, the, the, ex the positive externalities they can uh, they can have. So this is an example I'm working at and anyone interested in this, uh, I'm happy to engage in a discussion and, 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 and organizing next year workshop on this. So wrap up, think co-evolution. So I agree with Frank that evolutionary economics uh, for a long time has focused too much on supply, but that doesn't mean that we cannot uh, take up uh, issues of demand and in institutions in a systematic way. In fact, we have already a framework in place. Uh, for policy as well, put demand more central, not just work on the supply side conditions. Also empower consumers uh, to, um, uh, to voice alternative uh, ways of, of consuming. And my last point is that institutional change is the key to sustainability. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this excellent talk. Um, I will take the opportunity to start off with a question, then I will let the floor in. Um, so I was going to ask you if uh, climate change isn't good for economic growth, but I will rephrase that question and um, ask you uh, if we can, this awareness of climate change, uh, how can we use it uh, to move into a more sustainable society? Huh? Hi, kids. Um, well, I think it's necessary, but not sufficient. And uh, so that's one. The second is actually the awareness has been decreasing in the last couple of years. If you take opinion surveys, people are now concerned about other issues, jobs and employment and all that. But yeah, my, I mean, I, I, I do think it's crucial in order to get political change. Policymakers, in, in a way, also need incentives to change. And, and one is public attention for something. That's what all, if you look at all the politics sort of follows what's, what, what people, all, so that I did like the, what, 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 I think mobilization more generally is, is a crucial phenomenon, which, which includes the public, but also the social movements and maybe new kind of enterprises. And so I, I, I would agree with Kuhn that, uh, that that is crucial and public attention and awareness is one issue of that. And, and then maybe policymakers and firms will follow. Okay. Any comments? 
Oh, I think we can. Okay, move to let's. Uh, do you have any questions from uh, the audience? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Frank van der Most. I'm a Dutch too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I work at the Economic History Department here at the University of Lund, um, and I used to work at Circle for a couple of years. Um, I'm not sure I have a question, um, but I have a proposition that um, I think uh, addresses at least the previous panel as well, and maybe all four. So my impression is that we pre pretty much know how things are running in this world, right? And we are wondering, why can't we address these challenges? Now, if I make, a, make it provocative, I'm saying uh, innovation studies is focusing on the wrong stuff. Maybe they did it right until now, but now I think it's an excellent uh, moment to focus it on decision-making processes. So that's... Uh, political sciences are doing, but I'm saying maybe if we do it with uh, innovation studies and the uh, conceptual instruments we develop there, we come up with different answers to the question, if we all know what needs to be done, why isn't it happening? It goes for climate change, it goes for poverty, and you name any big issue, and I think you, you end up in the, in the same point. Most people know what's going wrong, and somehow we can't do anything about it. So I think this uh, could be an opportunity for uh, innovation studies to study this process rather than the processes of innovations we've considered so far. Any comments? Who would like to start? Yeah, Marianne. Um, I think that's a very interesting point, and so I mean I think it is a question of um, if we sort of we know all of this, we have the knowledge, we have quite a few people who are um, climate change deniers, right? And um, unfortunately, many of them are in the U.S. Congress. Um, but you know, um, by and large, as a consumer, I don't have an, a, an opportunity, a choice set that allows me a lot of latitude um, in decisions that I make. And so I, mean, I think the idea of sort of trying to get to some root causes would be, um, is it innovation studies or, um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not sure, is that this community's job? I like what Frank said about, oh, is it on? Can I do this? Yeah. I think you have to keep it a bit close. Okay. <laughs> Can I do this? No. Okay. Technology is forcing me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, um, I like Frank said, um, you know, that a lot of changes that we see are due to social movements. And I think we don't know much about social movements. To me, it was a great disappointment that Occupy Wall Street went nowhere. Um, and I wonder, have we seen the last of it or, you know, sort of how might this evolve? But, um, you know, I, I do think that these are the larger sort of systemic questions. It's just a matter of, um, for us as a community, and I, I feel as someone who studies innovation and entrepreneurship that I liked it a lot better when those were marginalized topics rather than being so front and center now and something that we promote for absolutely everyone. And I think um, that I'm quite worried about um, the system that we've set up for um, for science, for funding science, the idea of research accountability. I'm not so in convinced that the triple helix is a good or sustainable model. And so those, to me, are more innovation study type topics. Yeah, I, I, I think Ron uh, Bosma already um, uh, indicated that the, the link with political science would be strengthened, and that means we really uh, should learn about them and they should also learn uh, about us. Same holds for institutional sociologists. They look at social movements, uh, 
consumer uh, collective action among consumers, among firms, but they d engage very little with, with the innovation literature. And my second reaction would be if I observe uh, my own country, um, the national government and decision making uh, at the national government simply they voiced that they don't no longer have the ambition to solve it. So they gave it back to the civil society. And that means that uh, more local governments and other kinds of maybe newly established uh, institutions have to pick it up. But national governments with uh, other topics uh, have given up the ambition to, to, to solve these problems. And precisely to, to that comment, I would like to ask a question. Uh, lately, well, I'm, I'm not an expert in, uh, uh, in, let's say, for example, CO2 transitions, uh, but of course everybody is interested in it be, uh, be, uh, as it is such an important topic, and uh, even if you're not a scholar in it. Uh, as far as I read uh, the literature, those few things that I read, there now appear also to be some, uh, uh, well, scholars and economists uh, that kind of say, well, look, essentially there is a, is a problem of collective action uh, and that is characterized by a prisoner's dilemma, uh, which basically means, uh, uh, well, of course, in an ideal world, of course, as you already said, there are also deniers, but even if there was a world where everybody understood uh, that climate change is happening, uh, still, uh, if everybody is vested uh, into climate change, and there, uh, there is a, sorry in uh, in sticking to the old uh, to the old technologies, and if there is a trade off be uh, between growth and so on, then nobody has an incentive to stop without having, let's say, a large scale consensus, which is difficult uh, to achieve. Another uh, another problem of collective action is, of course, uh, that. Uh, long-term or climate, let's say, climate-saving activities are long-term investments, which uh, typically transcend uh, uh, the usual planning horizon of uh, policymakers. Uh, it's more than four years and even more than uh, eight years, probably more in the range of 50 to 100 years. Uh, so some scholars, and I'm really taking no position to that, so it's really an honest question to which I don't have an answer, uh, some scholars have said, look, we should draw away attention from solving a problem of uh, collective action that we cannot solve and, sim and rather move attention to mitigating uh, the drawbacks of climate change. So, for example, we sh should start thinking, well, what will happen to the people living on the Maldives when they drown in the water? Uh, so this is a very uh, this is a very cynical position, obviously, but uh, uh, and uh, it's it's uh, well um, I'm not sure uh, whether one should be so pessimistic. But what is your position also in the panel to uh, to that position? Um, well, I, I agree. The adaptation agenda is, is important and probably will gain further in importance. Uh, but I don't think we should yet give up on the mitigation uh, part. Um, and I, I agree, the uh, prisoner's dilemma is an important one. But I mean, I did have some... Pr <laughs> it's very much framed. You, I'm, I'm, I, I think the problem is, is broader than that. It, it, if, you, if you start with prisoner's dilemma, it, you start with sort of a rational choice view of actors and what, what brings about... So I, I feel your fundamental assumption of what the world is about, maybe that's related to Frank von der Most. I fundamentally disagree with that assumption that we're all rational choice and therefore that, that's the... There are very other paradigms, which some, some are more about structuralist or institutions. It's about, about our ideas and our identity. There are interpretive paradigms, which say it's all about learning. So actually, contra to Frank von der Most, we don't agree about where to go. We actually have very different views about what is the best solution, and we should just try an experimentation and learning and, and building support for change. And of course, you've got power explanations as well. People that say, no, it's all about big power and, and the power blocks. So uh, that doesn't address your question. I, I, would ju I just had some problem with framing 
the, the framing of your problem, that, that, that that's the only problem we have. I, I, I think if we have to take other problem framing, that also brings you to different kind of solutions, much more along, along the lines of co-evolution, mobilization, learning, experimentation, and, and that brings in entrepreneurship, innovation, but also more the social side. The, the challenge when you start talking about climate change is that basically all social science will try to have a say about it. And uh, I would like to sort of steer the direction a little bit back to, you know, what can innovation studies contribute to, 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 to climate change. And um, uh, in that sense, I mean, what I think a lot of the other social sciences perhaps lack is uh, A, that they don't really have a theory of novelty, that uh, sort of solutions are being asked because of the analysis of the problem but how that sort of solution should be sort of produced is a bit sort of black boxed. I think you see that pretty clearly in, for example, the resilience literature, where sort of there's, a, again, a very good uh, analysis of the problems, but when it comes to suggesting solutions, there's, there's less of a, of a resonance. Um, similarly, there is an emerging literature about, for example, social innovation, but it's sort of conceptually and theoretically pretty sort of dispersed internally. So in that sense, I think what innovation studies, or the traditional innovation studies we've emerged in the 80s and 90s can contribute is that we have sort of 20, 30 years of sort of research insights and theory that we can build on in understanding novelty. And I, I agree with Frank and, and many other points made here that we should broaden our agenda, but we should also sort of not try to start addressing all the problems and challenges related to, to climate change. I think we should also try to sort of stick to what the topic of innovation studies is about. Thank you, um, Thijs Hansen from the Department of Human Geography and CIRCLE um, as well. So thank you for a very coherent um, um, panel here. I think both Frank and Kuhn and Lars more or less explicitly said that we want, uh, we need to have more focus on demand side policies. Yeah? But then Kuhn had this thing on the sharing economy, yeah, which is, of course, inherently very, very difficult to control for policymakers. So I'm wondering if, if all these calls for more focused on demand-driven policies are being overtaken by reality. I mean, can we, can we steer demand in the sharing economy? Uh, I think we need to rethink the role of government more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't seen many examples, despite uh, Matsukato's uh, book, where government has been successful in challenge, challenging, uh, challenging uh, technological development, but they but they do react uh, to 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 innovations, and they can curve it in more or less social or sustainable manners. But they are reacting to changing social practices, technological opportunities that are basically out of their hands, and that's also what you see in the sharing economy. Each city now has to think how to deal with Airbnb and how to deal with Uber and, and with car sharing and all kinds of new things. And there are great opportunities, uh, but there's not one way you can organize it. And, and that's why it's a political process in which they have to involve all the stakeholders, not the least the citizens, in how they want to organize those platforms. So I don't see any tension uh, here. Yeah, uh, when, w when it comes to the question about, you know, creating demand for um, low carbon innovation, I think, uh, I mean, there's an interesting development with, with the sharing economy. Um, a question would also be sort of, you know, what's the geography of a sharing economy? Um, why is this now suddenly very popular in the Netherlands? Would it be equally popular in, in Sweden? Um, I think the Swedish sort of policy response, and there I sort of resonate with, with some of the work that Charles Atkins has been doing now, is perhaps a bit more sort of state-oriented, and there sort of there's a lot of discussion now about the role of public procurement for innovation and public procurement for green innovation. And again, also a lot of cities are, are in Stockholm, Malmö, Gothenburg, they are moving pretty hard ahead in sort of uh, procuring for, you know, green infrastructures. Um, so, I mean, th there will also be sort of different sort of 
territorially conditioned responses to how to increase the demand for, for, for green innovation. Well, no, I would just like to ask Kuhn. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm very much, I like the sharing economy, but I was just thinking about the fish that Mariana showed. Because uh, we've always been sharing, but without money. We've also be sh always been sharing. We want my tool, we want to give you a right. Now we are monetizing our private assets, making them available. So it's not, it, it sometimes feels a bit con contra to sharing, or, or sharing's got this nice notion, you know, of communitarian and doing things together. But it's, it's mostly actually e e economizing wow. things. And I'm not against it, because I mean, otherwise it doesn't happen. But, but there's a bit of a tension between the nice sort of communitarian framing versus what it actually does. Now, I, if you read the book uh, that has mo attracted most of the attention by Rachel Botsman, she frames it very much as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an uh, alternative or a new, a new kind of capitalism even, because uh, in the Fordist age, the, the ideal was for you as a consumer to be independent of all the other consumers, to own everything uh, mm -hmm. as a household. Uh, and that means we uh, have been less and less sharing uh, because you didn't want to bother uh, someone else. Uh, and now uh, with platforms, you, you can share with anyone you like and uh, uh, sometimes make money out of it, but many people share without asking any money. So all these things are conting contingent. It's very much in the beginning. And I think this is the time where people can still shape uh, these platforms and try to uh, bend it in the ways and, and, in, in, the, and in the political institutional context uh, of, the, of, the, of the country in question. Do you have any comments? Well, I'm just thinking that this is an interesting opportunity to study the diffusion of Uber. And so um, I use it a lot. I think <laughs> it's <laughs> much better than um, the other options. But in different cities, there are different levels of services. As it's been introduced, many times the cab drivers will uh, protest. And so they're able to block this or, or to block certain levels of service. And so it just seems like this is a great um, opportunity to study these power relationships, this diffusion across different um, social contexts, social political and power contexts. I think we have time for one more question. So you, you were first here. Okay, I'm, I'm Charles Edquist. Um, the, the issue of demand and uh, innovation procurement is policy, so I, I will relate to that in the next session. But the, the comment I have now is that uh, the issue of growth uh, pops up. It's an undercurrent under this uh, uh, discussion on climate change. and. Um, uh, there is also uh, that's in the academic community, but also in the in the in the green movement. Uh, there is a growth no growth uh, dichotomy, and to me, uh, it is very simplistic, uh, because um, what 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 matters is not really two percent larger production or not, uh, or, or five percent. It's rather the the content of the growth. Uh, and the climatic Im implication of the content of the growth, or and not even uh, it, it's, it should be generalized not only to content of the growth, but content of the whole production and the whole consumption. And no one of you has touch of you or, of this issue at all. Uh, would you have any comment, uh, any of you in the panel on that? Anyone would like to start? Yeah. I mean, I, I I, I would agree with you, Charles, and I, I personally also find this debate about degrowth entirely unproductive. And, and also, because uh, after a five-year recession with, with tremendous negative effects, I don't think it's politically very wise to call for a hundred-year recession. I mean, it's, it's just, even if it's good for the climate, it's just not, so I don't really see why. I, I, so, uh, but also, I think, I've just written a paper which, which distinguishes three positions. One is reform, revolution, and reconfiguration. Reform means, let's stay the same, just do a bit of green products and we need to buy them, that will solve it. 
So that's the economist's view, if I simplify. Revolution says, no, capitalism is wrong. We need to stop we have a different kind of society and growth. Is, I don't think that's productive. Reconfiguration is more looking at concrete systems, energy systems, transport, and indeed the co-evolution aspect. So not everything needs to be comprehensively changed, but reconfiguring things, new technologies, a bit of new behavior, new infrastructures. So that, that's my, because I think that the dichotomy between growth and no growth, for me, is, is, not an inter is not a debate I would like to engage in, because I don't think it's going anywhere. Any comments? Okay, uh, one short question. Yeah, a very short one. Merrick Gertler, University of Toronto. I wanted to come back to Marianne on cities <coughs> and link what you said to what Lars said, because there's a disconnect. I'm a skeptic too, and I think it, you know I appreciate that you shouldn't take these sort of uh, celebratory arguments at face value. But there is a school of thought, and, and Lars referred to this in passing, that cities are actually going to lead the way in producing progressive change in response to the climate change challenge. Um, and you know um, there are good reasons to believe that uh, that that might be the case. Um, it, and there's evidence to, to suggest, for example, that they have formed global networks that bypass nation states entirely, you know, referring to the earlier discussion about prisoners' dilemma and so on, um, because they've, they are at the coalface. They are very much on the front line uh, in experiencing the impacts. But the potential payoffs are, are actually quite large because of the density and the sheer size of these places. So if you can actually bring about progressive change locally, um, you know, it actually has potentially global impact. So, you know, I get the skeptic argument, but I actually think you, you might be in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. Right. No, and I think, Merrick, I'm, um, I'm very pessimistic in this talk, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that's sort of nice for me visiting Sweden, so first of all, I got here on an airplane. Oh, that's bad for my environmental footprint. But taking the train around and walking is very pleasant. There's an old discussion about what's the optimal city size and what's the optimal sort of distribution. And I think the idea of everyone living in a city is really not what we want. Um, I think that, again, going back to um, consumer choice, people are forced to move to cities not because they prefer cities, but it's where the jobs are. And for a long time, and I can, um, can speak to the American context, that we've had sort of 100 years of policy that has favored urban areas over smaller cities. And so I think that this is a, a researchable topic. Quick response as well, then. Um, I think a lot of the literature now that looks at sort of cities and sustainability is really looking at sort of city responses to climate change. So it's a lot about sort of, you know, taking solutions and sort of implementing it in, in the urban context. Unfortunately, there's really very little literature that builds on the work of Jane Jacobs, which sort of emphasizes that radical innovation through recombination typically takes place in cities. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, really, you know, I would argue for the geography of transitions to really sort of try to unpack uh, are there sort of urban advantages to uh, really sort of in a c a cities as breeding grounds for the type of innovations required for sustainability transitions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, it's time to stop now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank, Lars, Marianne, and Cohen, for this very interesting discussion. I hope we'll have the opportunity to maybe invite some of you to the ministry and to continue this discussion. Uh, there's half an hour break now, and then we will come back uh, with the final panel when we move into policy making. So, thank you. <laughs>